humble. Its ancestor, the Bort VE-7, was the first plane to take off from the U.S. Navy's original aircraft carrier, the Langley, on October 17, 1922. The VE-7 had previously equipped the Navy's first two fighter squadron. In 1910, Chance Milton Bort started his association with flying machines. Born on the 26th of February, 1890, he trained as a mechanical engineer, and after completing his education, set about building an empire, which would survive numerous moves around the U.S., as well as changes in management. The first planes built by Bort were constructed in a third-floor room of a disused lady's stocking factory. Sections of the frame were lowered to the street from a window and reassembled there. This enabled the engineers to test the engine with the plane tethered to a telephone pole. The plane was the VE-7, Bort's seventh design labeled Bort Experimental. It was a very successful design and more than compensated for Bort's eccentric construction methods. In February 1918, Army pilots tested the plane and their enthusiastic reports resulted in the VE-7's promotion to fighter and it was immediately ordered into mass production. When World War I ended, some production of the VE-7 continued, including the first orders from the Navy. One of Bort's all-metal designs, the V-141, was a spectacular failure. The plane's spin recovery was appallingly dangerous, despite the best efforts of the engineering crew. The design was modified slightly, with a stretched frame and new tail, but the renamed V-143 still failed to impress buyers. The immediate predecessor of the F-4U was conceived in 1936 by Bort's chief engineer, and the design was completed and submitted in 1938. Out of six fighter submissions, this was the first to be successful. Named the V-166 by the company, it was submitted for testing as the XF-4U. Although modifications were to follow throughout the ensuing years, the essential look of the F-4U remained the same. But certain aspects of the original design didn't quite come up to expectations. The landing gear functioned well enough under normal conditions, but during the Second World War, pilots were often forced to land and not always on a runway. It soon became apparent that the Corsair's landing gear was too weak for the punishment it was to endure. Frequently, wheels fell off, and in some cases, the whole assembly would snap right off the fuselage. This tendency to break made the U.S. Navy nervous, and several changes were made to increase the weight-bearing strength and shock absorbency of the landing gear. Due to the necessity for carrier-based operation during the war, a whole new problem presented itself. Could the Corsair stand up to the rigors of carrier takeoffs and landings? This was a large, heavy aircraft, and its landing gear was still too weak for the batterings it endured. Because of the very real danger of missing a hook, pilots had a tendency to slam their plane down hard, and this placed additional stress on the assembly. The Navy carried out extensive tests to determine the safety of the design, and the responsibility rested very firmly on the shoulders of the engineers. The shock of coming down hard on a carrier deck had to be allowed for, and no one expected the pilots to change their landing methods to accommodate unsafe gear. In most cases, the test pilots landed successfully, but sometimes the landing gear let them down, and the U.S. Navy was reluctant to endanger pilots until the problem was solved. After more testing and further modifications, the landing gear was not so hazardous, but another problem immediately became apparent. Due to the extended nose of the Corsair, the pilot's visibility was substantially reduced. The engine was just too big and the cockpit too far back for the pilots to accurately judge their approach. Landing on an aircraft carrier required great precision for the pilot, and the F-4U's poor landing visibility made carrier landings a dangerous and skillful operation. There seemed to be no easy solution to this problem, and the U.S. Navy were at a loss. Eventually, the Corsair was passed over to the British Navy on lease, and it was put to immediate use on their carriers. The pilots who flew the Corsair regularly from carriers soon developed new techniques for judging their distance from the deck. 
Sometimes, though, the landing gear still cause problems. Here, we see a pilot approach the carrier with only one wheel down, but no one would doubt the skill of the pilot who landed it. Crashes were not uncommon, usually the result of damage incurred by enemy fire. Here, we see a damaged fighter lose control and crash into the tower. Accidents such as this fully illustrate the dangers the pilots routinely took on. Sometimes the aircraft will come down just short of the carrier, but in most cases the pilot lived to fly again. One of the most attractive features of the Corsair is the capability of folding its wings over the canopy. This design characteristic allowed easier storage on board the carriers. The sight of the wings unfolding before takeoff is majestic to say the least. Taking off, the F4U still caused great visibility problems, but its record was fast making it a legend among naval aviators. Although the Navy had been slow to take up the Corsair for carrier use, by early 1945, large numbers of Corsairs were flying from carriers in the Pacific and continued in service long after the more established F6F Hellcat. Several versions of the Corsair were built from the prototype F4U-1, which flew on Guadalcanal in February 1941, to the F4U-7, which was designed specifically for the French Navy with a raised pilot seat. Many were designed as night fighters, the first of these being the F4U-2, with radar pod mounted on the starboard wing. In addition, several models were modified for photo reconnaissance work, including the 1P, which was equipped to carry a K-21 camera in the rear fuselage. All of the variations, however, had one unmistakable characteristic in common, the extraordinary gull wings. They enabled the necessary 90-degree angle with the fuselage, which would otherwise have needed a mid-wing design similar to the Hellcat. The gull wings served another purpose as well, they gave the Corsair sufficient ground clearance to match the 13-foot propeller with the length of the landing gear. Of all the many diverse and imaginative aircraft designs, the F4U Corsair is by far the most interesting to look at. You certainly know a Corsair when you see one, and the graceful wings for which it was named Bent Wing Bird by its pilots were responsible for one of the more flattering nicknames. Others included Ensign Eliminator, Old Hose Nose, and The Hog. The Japanese refer to it as Whistling Death. The power behind the Whistling Death was a twin-row 18-cylinder air-cooled radial engine. With an initial bore of 5 and 3 quarter inches and a stroke of 6 inches, it had a capacity of 2,804 cubic inches. By the end of the war, Pratt & Whitney engines were being produced at over 30 plants in the USA, and six other companies were producing the engines on a nominal wartime license fee. The fashions of the time dictated that the air-cooled engine was on the way out, and the liquid-cooled engine favored by the Europeans was set to take over. However, for carrier use, the radial offered advantages in weight, maintenance, and supplies that justified its continual use. Despite wartime fashions, two of America's most successful fighters of the war and the first two to exceed 400 miles per hour used the unfashionable air-cooled engine. They were the P-47 Thunderbolt and the F-4U Corsair. When Pratt & Whitney built the Corsair's engine, they knew that however powerful it might be, 
its function was still primarily to do one thing, drive a propeller. The Hamilton Standard Company was contracted to build the Corsair's propeller, and they employed the highest technology in the field. The props were built around a cold stretch steel pole, and the skin was then welded on with silver. As with any field of design, the Corsair's engine and propeller were a combination of experience, knowledge and tireless testing and refinements that produced a product of flawless craftsmanship, which in the case of the Corsair contributed to making it such a resoundingly successful machine. A thirsty Corsair will drink 234 gallons of fuel from tank 1 in the fuselage and a further 300 gallons from tank 2 in the wing. Its oil capacity is more modest, a mere 23.5 gallons. It would be easy as we enter the 21st century to consider propeller-driven aircraft a thing of the past. In light of recent scientific and technological advancements, surely such basic and obsolete flying machines are nothing more than relics of a bygone era. Space stations are under construction, and the idea of man exploring into the farthest reaches of space is no longer the stuff of science fiction, but science fact. With that in mind, wouldn't the idea of wanting to fly a prop plane seem crazy? Of course not. Imagine the pleasure of taking your Corsair out for a spin. The warm summer sun, the fields and prairies bathed in golden light, the clear blue sky, and not a sound to be heard except the drone of your engine. The skies were not always this clear, however, and there were many sounds beside that of a solitary engine. Not so long ago, the skies were filled with a different sound, the sounds of explosions, gunfire, and death. The Corsair featured prominently in many of the battles that took place during the Second World War. It fared well in aerial combat, downing 2,140 enemy aircraft for the loss of only 189, a kill ratio of 11.3 to 1.
It was the responsibility of the ground crew to routinely check and replace the Corsair weapons, a job they took very seriously. This array of destructive hardware certainly gave the enemy something to think about. The F-4U was equipped with formidable armaments. Eight five-inch rockets under the wings or two 1,000-pound bombs, plus six 0.5-inch Browning MG-53 machine guns in the outer wings with 390 rounds per gun. From the F-4U-1C onwards, four 20mm cannons were carried in the wings. Loading the wing rockets was a relatively simple operation, but to prevent the risk of rockets firing prematurely, or not at all, careful installation was essential. Every day during the war, this operation was carried out hundreds of times on countless F-4Us and other fighters. One can only hazard a guess of how many rounds of ammunition were fired from Corsairs during their history of combat. The ferocity and deadliness of the Corsair as it attacks ground targets is evident in this footage recovered from the F-4U's onboard cameras. Here, pilots dropped napalm bombs on targets in the Pacific Islands. These bombs didn't need to hit the mark. They incinerated everything in the immediate area. Locals lucky enough to survive the attacks could do little to prevent the fires from spreading. 
performance of the Corsair left little to be desired. With a now well-established track record and the fact that it had double the horsepower and destructive force of Japan's main fighter, the Zero, there was no denying its value to the Allies. Indeed, with the Corsair traveling at speeds of up to 462 miles per hour, the enemy were lucky to get near it. The Corsair measures in at 41 feet across and 33 feet in length. On the runway, it stands 15 feet high and has a total wing area of 314 square feet. The Corsair can weigh from 9,167 pounds empty to 16,160 pounds fully loaded. The first squadron on Guadalcanal, BMF-124, had established the success of the Corsair. In their tour of duty, they downed 68 Japanese planes against losses of 11 Corsairs and three pilots. The first F-4U ace was Lieutenant Kenneth Walsh, who downed his fifth plane on May 13, 1943. Walsh went on to chalk up a further 21 combat victories. The Corsairs were now being produced in large quantities, and the enthusiastic Marines were only too happy to receive them. In the Pacific, they were a dominant factor in the conflict. Throughout the long, arduous campaign through the islands, the Corsairs gave the Marines a distinct advantage over the best the Japanese could throw at them. The pilots who flew these great warbirds and the maintenance and engineering crews who kept them in the air showed little of the stress and hardship they endured during the war. Cheerful faces masked a fear and dread that must surely have lingered beneath their calm exteriors. A pleasant game of cards, a laugh and a joke with your colleagues. All this could soon be disrupted by the call to action. There were essentially two kinds of scramble used. The fast scramble, which occurred when enemy aircraft were spotted on an attack course with the airfield, and the slow scramble, which happened when the Corsairs were ordered to attack an enemy target. Here, the crew chief and pilot operate with complete coordination. While the pilots are being briefed, the crew chief starts the engines to warm up the cylinder head to the correct temperature. Then he assists the pilot with his parachute before taxi and takeoff. In the absence of a proper runway, gridded metal sheets were used, which could be easily laid on any bare ground or sand. They were called Marston mats and frequently came into service on the beaches of the Pacific Islands. They were also used in China, India, Burma and Italy. The Pacific beaches formed an idyllic, if somewhat bizarre, background for this squadron of Corsairs. Doubtless the white sun-baked sand and clear blue water were an enticing sight to these pilots, who were forced to spend much of their time cocooned in a metal cockpit. The war was no holiday though, and while these pilots were sunning themselves on the beach, a raging battle was taking place not too far away. Near Okinawa, a large contingent of Japanese aircraft attacked American ships. The U.S. lost three destroyers and seven planes in the attack, but the Japanese lost a whole lot more than that. After scout planes had sighted the enemy, a fast carrier task force was sent to intercept the Japanese planes. 341 of the attacking aircraft were destroyed, 245 by carrier aircraft, 55 by fighters, and 51 by anti-aircraft fire. This was just the beginning of a very bad day for the Japanese. 
carrier aircraft attacked Yumato, a 45,000 ton battleship and the last in the Japanese fleet. It was hit by at least three rockets and eight heavy bombs and sank about 50 miles southwest of Kyushu, the southern island of Japan. In addition, two cruisers and three destroyers went down and more destroyers were left burning. Of the entire Japanese force, only a few destroyers escaped and they were heavily hit with rockets and machine guns. The destruction of the Yamato was a heavy blow indeed for the Japanese. But for the pilots involved in the victory, it was no doubt the cause for much celebration. Between combat missions, the Corsair was lovingly maintained by the ground crews. These men were responsible, among other things, for the safety and well-being of the pilots who flew the planes. This meant that every aspect of the Corsair's mechanical systems had to be checked and rechecked, tweaked, tightened, and sometimes rebuilt, until there was no danger of a system's failure during any of the complex maneuvers the Corsair and the pilot were to perform. In a very real sense, the men who maintained the planes were every bit as important as the pilots who flew them, for many lives rested in their skilled and capable hands. On returning from a combat mission, the pilots were individually checked off by the squadron leader. While the planes were being refueled, every man had to be accounted for. And as in the case of De Fabio on this checklist, sometimes that meant a tense wait. The scramble order is given. This time it's a fast scramble and the men of the 4th Marine Air Wing are wasting no time. A squadron of Japanese fighters has been sighted 20 miles south of the base. It is uncertain whether the enemy intends to attack, but these Marines are taking no chances. If the Japanese fighters do intend to attack the base, they'll have their work cut out. During the Second World War, the Allied nations produced the greatest number of bases of any war in human history. Great Britain had over 1,200 aces, while the United States took the record among the Allied nations with a total of 1,281. Japan had only 26 aces, but that was possibly due to their fondness for kamikaze attacks. 
the view from the sea was almost as spectacular as that from the air. Here, a pilot succeeds in pulling his aircraft out of its nosedive before losing control and plummeting into the sea. One of the most spectacular explosions caught on film is this amazing shot of a carrier being destroyed. The mushroom cloud of this explosion rose hundreds of feet into the air, obliterating the sky and showering the ocean with dust and twisted metal. Many of the planes brought down during the war were the victims of anti-aircraft fire from ships. Here we see the efficiency of the ship's guns. Enemy fire wasn't responsible for all the Allied losses. Sometimes unfortunate crashes occurred when the pilots were returning to the carrier. Here, a pilot misses his hook and skids across the deck. Another less fortunate pilot ends up sitting in the middle of a fireball. This pilot came in too fast and ran right off the edge of the carrier. So many aircraft were destroyed during the war that nobody could afford the time or manpower to clean up the mess. Very soon, burnt out and destroyed planes littered the side of the makeshift runways and the sight of those shell-like carcasses could easily be described as an airplane's graveyard. In most cases, the planes had come down on fire and it was the responsibility of the on-site fire crews to put out the blaze. Firefighting has always been a dangerous and skillful operation, and no one knew that better than the men who battled these infernos. Few domestic house fires have equaled the intensity of these blazes. The brave firefighters who tackled the many aircraft fires were specially trained in aviation firefighting and carrier-based firefighting. Don't forget, these planes have hundreds of gallons of fuel in their tanks, and one wrong move from the firefighters could be fatal. This Hellcat pilot had a very lucky escape from his burning plane. Most carrier fires were caused by planes crashing into them at speed. Kamikaze attacks were common, but sometimes the crashes were just unfortunate accidents. Fires on ships often got out of control, and in most cases the best fire crews could hope for was to rescue a few survivors. However skilled the firefighters were, there was little any of them could do with some of these shattered machines. Any that came down burning were extinguished, but most came apart in mid-air and settled at the bottom of the ocean in pieces. Any carriers unlucky enough to be hit stood a good chance of being destroyed because of the large quantities of aviation fuel contained on board. Here, a carrier explodes, leaving little of its original frame behind. <laughs> 
The New Zealand Navy saw a lot of action during the war, and like the British, they've mastered the art of carrier landings. Their pilots tended to bounce the Corsairs more violently than the British, but then the New Zealanders were always less formal in their approach. There's little doubt that these men were a happy crew. The friendships that developed between pilots during the war often lasted the rest of their lives, and the friendship seen here was reflected in crews of every nationality. Many of the 1,200 ace pilots listed as British were in fact from New Zealand, and their highest scoring ace, C.F. Gray, brought down 28 enemy aircraft. The fun-loving and enthusiastic nature of the New Zealanders is well known and can be observed in the style of their flying. Not all Corsair pilots enjoy sunny beaches and warm temperatures. The climate was quite unpleasant in the middle of winter and thick snow could damage the Corsair's engine if left uncovered. Corrosion was also a problem. The salt content of the snow was sufficient to cause severe blistering to the machine guns and other weaponry, if not cleaned and oiled regularly. These engineers probably wished they were back sweating on those beaches. But in truth, the severe cold caused less ill health than the constant intense heat of the Pacific summer. The Corsair flew a total of 64,051 missions during World War II. 54,470 of these were from land bases, while the remaining 9,581 were from carriers. It fared well in aerial combat, downing 2,140 enemy aircraft for the loss of only 189. Other losses included 349 down by anti-aircraft fire, 164 in landing accidents, and 992 for other reasons. This totaled 1,694 aircraft lost out of 12,571 airframes built. Storms at sea were not uncommon, and during these fierce tempests, it was necessary for the deck crews to be especially cautious. One missed knot, and the Corsair could go overboard. 
It was still possible to launch the Corsairs in these conditions, but with the reduced visibility from the cockpit, landing would be a hazardous undertaking. In 1945, World War II came to its end. It had been the longest and most destructive war in history. Countless millions had died over the six years of conflict, and atrocities beyond belief have been witnessed by the whole world. The contribution made by the Corsair was responsible for huge leaps both in design and engineering, and piloting skills had never been as good. It is little wonder then that by the war's end, the future of the Corsair had been secured. Its objective to be the best fighter in the world had been achieved and recognized. It had outflown all other aircraft and saved many allied lives on the ground, on the ocean, and in the skies. The Corsair was indeed a legend, but the last chapter of that legend had not yet been written. No one could have known what was just around the corner. The North Koreans attacked South Korea on June 25, 1950. That event triggered a war in which more than 3 million Koreans died, around 1 million Chinese were killed, and American casualties numbered 54,246. President Truman immediately appealed to the United Nations to take police action against the unwarranted attack. Under the banner of the United Nations, America was able to send troops and forces. Once again, the Corsair was never far from the action, and with the recent experience of war behind them, the pilots and engineers of the Corsair had none of the problems that had dogged them at the beginning of World War II. In the Korean War, the F-4U and its crews operated with precision and dedication. It is quite understandable that with the victories and glory of past triumphs behind them, the pilots could enjoy the feeling of confidence derived from piloting the best fighter in the world. There had been some interesting developments since the Corsair had last seen action. And although flying machines were still being produced, not all of them had wings. One thing about the war had not changed. The destruction was as devastatingly dramatic as in the previous war, and napalm bombs often obliterated whole villages. Negotiations for a peace treaty were underway, but the aerial bombing in North Korea intensified and negotiations slowed down. In order to end the war quickly, the use of nuclear weapons was considered. Luckily, it never got that far. Even with a practice sufficiency employed by the Corsair's crew, mistakes still happen. Here, an incorrectly mounted rocket falls off the Corsair as it lands. The deck crew quickly run to retrieve the potentially dangerous weapon, and not wanting it to explode in their hands, they pass it to their friend. Wisely, the recipients of the rocket do the only sensible thing and throw it over the side. The Korean War heralded the beginning of a new age in aviation warfare. The jet had arrived, and while many World War II aircraft were still in use, a new sound filled the skies over war-torn Korea, the sound of jet versus jet combat. Soviet-built MiG-15s battled American-made F-86 Sabres, as well as F-80s and F-84s. 
One area of North Korea saw so much action from the Soviet jets that it became known as MiG Alley. With the arrival of the jet, propeller-driven aircraft were no longer considered aerodynamically efficient. The U.S. didn't want the Royal Navy's land lease Corsairs, and the British no longer wanted to pay for them. The two navies mutually agreed that the British would simply push them over the side, thus fulfilling the letter of the law. The Corsair dwarfs the Phantom Jet, but weighs only 2,000 pounds more and can carry a larger load of more varied weapons for approximately twice the Phantom's range. Also, the propeller-driven Corsair is only 30 miles per hour slower than its jet-powered cousin. For these reasons, the Corsair was not entirely unusable and indeed had many advantages over the jet. With this in mind, the United States Navy and Marines opted to keep the Corsair in operation throughout the Korean War. By June 8, 1953, a basic agreement was settled between both sides, and by the 17th of that month, the agreement was finalized. The armistice which ended the Korean War was finally signed on July 27, 1953. From the dawn of time, man has wanted to conquer the skies. Over countless decades, he has struggled to master the secrets of flight, but only in the last hundred years have his dreams been realized. The dreams of one man were realized more recently. Chance Milton Vought conceived a plane that mounted the biggest engine, the biggest propeller, was faster than any other fighter of its day, and would forever be remembered as the greatest combat aircraft in history. His plane lived up to every expectation and surpassed many. By the end of its production, Vought's plane could fly at speeds of up to 462 miles per hour and was certainly more powerful than any other fighter. That machine was the transport F4U Corsair.